Welcome to God Delusion number 16. We're in chapter 4 where Dawkins says why there almost certainly is no God. I've got about 22 pages left in chapter 4 and I can tell you that it's as you've seen if you watched the last video it's very convoluted it doesn't make any sense what he's saying but he's going to conclude this chapter with saying that there is no God and then he's going to move on to something else so I'll just go ahead and get through it and hopefully chapter 5 will be more understandable okay uh, he says quote and this is on page 159 here is the message that an imaginary intelligent design theorist might broadcast a scientist. If you don't understand how something works, never mind, just give up and say God did it, end quote. What he's doing is he's saying that people who believe in a God are not, it's just something that they make up. It's void of reasoning. And as we've said before, um, we that's not how it works. We know in our mind that we are sinners Everybody has a conscience. I realize everybody's conscience is different, but everybody knows there's a right and wrong, and everybody fails at obeying the conscience perfectly. And so because of that, we know that we have failed to meet the standard that God has put within us, and because of that, then uh, if that is to set aside our pride in our own us being God or us being good, and for us to look to the solution and so the solution is found in the only book that God ever wrote the Bible and that solution is trusting in Jesus death burial and resurrection as atonement for your sins all of that is a rational thinking process it's not us saying well we don't know what worked and we're too lazy to think up a rational answer so I guess God did it and that's it that's not the case. We are rationalizing. We are thinking through what we know and coming to God existing as a logical conclusion. What Darwin is doing, not Darwin, I keep calling him Darwin because he's close to Dawkins. What Dawkins is doing is he is ignoring that. He's ignoring reasoning, rational thinking, and he's saying, well, I, yeah, um, I, I'm a good person. I'm okay. So let's not talk about me. Uh, let's just show that God doesn't exist because then if I could show God doesn't exist Then I don't have to deal with the problem of me being a sinner. That's the bottom line. So um, His statement about intelligent design theorist is false He says um, He's talking about this Professor Behe, B-E-H-E, and um, he's questioning that evolution could ever find an explanation for the immune system, how the immune system exists, which is very good because how could the immune system exist unless it was designed? Very good questioning. And so, but he says that less forgiving is that Behe dismissed such research as unfruitful. So he says that it is. Um, that I can't forgive Professor Behe for saying that it is unfruitful to research why uh, we have an, a, a, an immune system. Well, why my point to this is, well, Dawkins has done the exact same thing. When we talk about there being God, Dawkins just immediately dismisses there being a God, and he considers that research of there being a God as unfruitful, so he won't do it. So why can he, he can't turn around and say Professor Behe is unwarranted in saying that uh, research to find an evolutionary explanation for an immune system is unfruitful. He's already found the explanation for an immune system, and that's God. So why would you, and that was done through research, so then why would you, um, why would you search for something else? Like if you find the answer to a question, why waste money on other possible answers? Because you've already got the answer. If you know that two plus two equals four, then why would you do research to try to find another answer to two plus two? You already found that you already found the answer. Well, they already did that. It's called core math. Well, yeah, yeah. But that, was, that was just an example. I know, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's a stupid thing that came out. 
And so he says, quote, it certainly, this is Dawkins, it certainly is unfruitful if your aim is to make propaganda among gullible lay people and politicians rather than to discover important truths about the real world, end quote. He's accusing, it's the pot calling the kettle black, basically, is what he's saying is that people are gullible just to have blind faith in what religion tells them. And that's what people who believe atheism and evolution are. So he's saying, why research the... Well, Behe is saying that you shouldn't follow evolution. Instead, you should follow gullible... Uh, get gullible people to believe there is a God rather than discovering important truths about the real world. And actually what Dawkins is doing is what he's claiming Behe is doing. He doesn't want people to discover important truths about the real world. The real world is the spirit world, and that will last forever. The material world, heaven and earth shall pass away, but the spirit realm lasts for eternity. And so we are told in Hebrews 11, in Hebrews 11, it says in verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then verse 3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not things were not made of things which do appear. So we use faith to understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, and when then we understand the things of the spirit realm. And so if you discount, if you take away faith, which is not some blind, oh, I hope it's true type thing, but it's based upon real rational evidence, as we've already talked about. And then if we have then the faith of Christ to teach us, will then teach us the things of the world. We will learn about the creation of the world through the faith of Christ. That's the only way we can understand that. Hebrews 11.3 says, through faith we understand that the world's refrained by the word of God. So if, you, if Dawkins wants to discover important truths about the real world, he can only do so by having faith, and he can only have faith by believing the gospel. And so that's what Behe, well, I don't know if Behe's done that or not, but believers, that's what believers have done. So it's not believing God and his word is not propaganda among gullible lay people and politicians. But believing the gospel is how you understand the true things of the spirit world and under how you understand the things of the material world. So if he wants to discover important truths about the real world, Dawkins needs to abandon evolutionary propaganda and evolutionary research and instead have faith in the gospel and then you can understand the things of this world and the spirit realm. Otherwise you cannot. So the accusation that he puts against Behe is really true not about Behe but about himself and about other evolutionary uh, evolutionists and atheists. So I would say yes Dawkins you're right so forget we want to lay aside propaganda um, that that is fed to gullible lay people and politicians, i.e. evolution and atheism, and we want to discover important truths about the real world. Therefore, believe the gospel, read the Bible. Good argument, Dawkins. Thanks for making my point. Uh, so then he's got uh, a quote from a judge regarding this case about this immune system thing that B he talked about. And one of the part of this quote is, their efforts help us combat and cure serious medical conditions, end quote. So in other words, the judge is saying, well, Behe, you're wrong because we need to do research into immune system uh, and how they evolved and everything is fruitful. Because if we understand how they evolved, then maybe uh, their research, even if we can't understand how they evolve, at least the research into uh, immune systems and how they work will help us combat and cure serious medical conditions. And I would say, okay, yeah, that's true. But he's missing the bigger point. And the bigger point is that everyone still dies. If, so you have these, uh, yeah, okay, so we learned to keep people living longer. And now the the, health, the life expectancy when I was a kid was 70 years old. And now I think the average life expectancy is 80. Okay, great. So you've increased 10 years of life. Well, that's good. Good to have an extra 10 years of life. But the bigger problem isn't that. The bigger problem is that everyone still dies. You live an extra 10 years. Well, that's nothing compared to eternity. 
God made the soul and the person to live forever. And so you are going to die whether you like it or not, whether you live to be like Methuselah, live to be 969 years old. He, Methuselah still died. So he lived almost 900 years longer than any other person in the world today lives. And yet he still died and still went to hell, probably. That's what it seems like. Um, so he still has the problem, even though he lived 900 years longer. So the solution isn't, well, let's combat serious medical conditions to make people live longer. The solution is to stop eternal death. And the only solution that's ever been given for that is to is Jesus' death on the cross and that his blood forgives us of our sins so that God can give us eternal life with him. And so if the judge is worried about um, life so much, well, why focus on getting an extra 10 years of life? Why not focus on getting eternal life as opposed to eternal damnation? Methuselah lived 900 years longer than anybody else on the earth here lives today, and yet he has been burning in hell, presumably, I don't know, but it seems like it, um, or else he would have been on, uh, he wouldn't have died at that time. Uh, he would have been on the ark because his death came in the flood. Is if you look at the genealogy, that's when it happens. So he probably is in hell. He's been burning in hell for over 3,000 years now. So yeah, he lived 900 years longer, but that doesn't matter because he's been suffering in an eternal torment for 3,000 years, and he's going to keep doing that forever. So why don't we get to the bigger problem? Forget about, I understand it's, I mean, it's good. I guess it can be good to have immune research and to discover things, but um, the bigger problem is dealing with sin. So why don't we deal with that problem instead of worrying about living longer? And also, when it talks about the immune system, just look at the advances in science, what this focus has done. We've taken all the money or the focus, I should, shouldn't say money, but we've taken all the focus off of God and His Word and we've put an entire focus on material existence so that billions of dollars are spent annually to come up with drugs to help with problems that the human body has. And even if those drugs and all the billions of dollars and millions of hours of research that have been done over the years and all these drugs, uh, the result is at best we find drugs that diminish problems or even take care of problems, but there are all these side effects. Look at these commercials for these drugs. Everyone has all these side effects. May cause diarrhea, fever, nausea, vomiting, um, redness, rashes, pain here, pain there. Bleeding. Um, a lot of t yeah, a lot of times the side effects are Heart worse. Attack. Heart attack. Yeah, the, the si uh, and some they'll even say and may cause premature death. A lot of times the side effects are worse than the problem. I'll give you an example. When I was in my early twenties, my hands would get cold all the time. Uh, and so you know, I thought, well, maybe I have carpal tunnel because I type a lot of, being an accountant. So I you know, found out, well, they did tests and said you had Raynaud's disease. I said, well, what's Raynaud's disease? Basically, it means that your hands in a cold environment get cold easily, and in a hot environment, they get hot easily. I said, well, what can be done about that? He says, well, we could give you a nitroglycerin paste that you could rub on your hands. And so then your hands probably wouldn't be cold. But the side effects of nitroglycerin is much greater than just simply having cold hands. Cold hands isn't going to kill me. It's not going to cause a disease. It's just my hands are going to be cold. So what you do is you blow on your hands, you sit on your hands, you put gloves on, uh, or you get to a warmer environment if possible. So, um, and I don't have any trouble with that being in South Alabama in the summer right now. Uh, no problem, you know. Um, the point is the side effects of the solution is far worse than the problem. So right there, that also to me shows that God exists, that God created us, that man and all his wisdom and all the millions of uh, hours of research and billions of dollars that have been spent to come up with cures uh, can't find cures for the common cold, can't find cures for any virus, can't find cures for cancer, can't find these cures in all this knowledge. So if that's what man does with all his research, um, yeah, he prolongs life 10 years. Well, that's all he can do. So what do you think the result of his research is going to be in trying to find who created the world? Uh, if you've ignored God, it's going to be bupkis. It's going to be nothing. So um, it's a waste of time. 
Okay, uh... Then uh, there's a quote from an American uh, geneticist, gen geneticist, geneticist, somebody studies, studies genes, um, and not the kind you wear. Why is God considered an explanation for anything? He is an unreachable, unknowable sky fairy. If you say that he has always existed, or he is outside of nature, this explains nothing. Okay, end quote. So, uh, a few things about what this Jerry Coyne, the American guy who studies genes, said. First off, why is God considered an explanation for anything? Well, if you understand, well, the second thing he says, unknowable sky fairy. Well, he is knowable. God is knowable. First John 4. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 7 says that if we love, we know God. Well, the only way we love, 1 John 4, 10, herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. So God loves us by sending His Son to die for our sins. When we accept that love, we receive His love. Now we can know God, for God is love. So this unknowable sky fairy, that's incorrect. God is love. We can know God when we accept His love. So we can know Him. And if we know God, then that opens us up to the eternal spiritual realm. And that's what's so great about reading the Bible and why I've spent thousands of hours reading the Bible and will continue to do so. Because it opens us up to knowing God and the realities of the eternal spiritual realm is far greater than anything of this, of this world. And Paul even says in Philippians 3.10, his ultimate aim, uh, Paul had great knowledge about God and his word, having seen God himself, having uh, received direct revelation, special revelation from God. And yet he says in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul says, knowing God and knowing his love is so great that I am willing and I encourage and welcome sufferings in this physical world and even dying because then I will know God in his fullness. And so he, since he welcomes those things, um, what knowing God and understanding the gospel and everything opens us up to this great spiritual realm that is far beyond the material realm to the point that we're willing to die to receive that knowledge. Um, and, and finally, when he says having always existed or being outside of nature explains nothing, no, it explains everything. Because if there is a God who is above us and outside of nature and is in a different realm, it explains how he could create such a complex universe. And so rather than explaining nothing, it explains everything. And then it taps us into this eternal spiritual realm that we couldn't possibly know anything about without knowing God, without uh, experiencing his love. And so all the, these evolutionists and atheists are doing is they're going down the path of greater ignorance. When if they were just believe the gospel, then they could experience true science. That's why first... Timothy 6.20 says, warns Timothy against oppositions of science falsely so-called. The science of this world is not real knowledge. It's temporary, temporal. It's of the material realm. The real science is of the spiritual realm, and that only comes about when you believe God in the gospel. And also, um, Daniel, the verse that says Daniel understood science. You got all these scientists out there, and they still can't understand it. They don't know what they're looking for they they're having trouble finding what they you know what whatever they're searching for they're having trouble finding it but daniel is a daniel understood right Read. daniel 1 4 children in whom is no blemish this is referring to daniel one of the people that he's talking about children in whom is no blemish but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace so you would think okay if god gave daniel the knowledge to understand science daniel probably it, hands down understood science more than all the scientists today 
because God gave him the knowledge. He gave him, you know, gave him the understanding of science. So you would think that a scientist today would believe in God and say, you know, I, I, I love science, you know, Lord, help me understand it. Give me the wisdom, your, your wisdom, your knowledge, understanding. And I mean, could you imagine what would open up for that scientist if he had, if he just trust and believe in Jesus? I mean, there's no telling what they would actually discover. It opens up all the realities of the spirit realm, and it also opens the realities of the material realm when you can understand that God made those things. Yeah, very good point. Thanks for watching.